What should you do when the enemy attacks? How do you take a stand for your faith in Jesus? We're going to answer those questions today in this wake up call. Good morning. This is your wake up call. It's wake up call 082. What to do when the enemy attacks. I'm your host, AJ, and this is the Faith for My Generation podcast. And I'm so excited that you're here watching and listening. Let's go to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Um, obviously, you can see that I'm reading through the book of Daniel just like it was prior to that, reading through Jeremiah. We had three wake up calls come from that first chapter in Jeremiah. This is our second one out of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. It's probably a very well known, we'll call it Bible story, but I don't really like that phrase, Bible story. I mean, it is a story from the Bible, but I like historical account of a hero of faith because it's something that actually took place. It actually happened. Daniel chapter 6, and it's what we know as Daniel and the lion's den. I hope to flesh out some things that you've never seen before because when I was studying it and making the, my notes for this wake-up call today, for this podcast episode, there were some things I didn't know that I, that I now know. And that's the wonderful thing about continually studying your Bible, constantly reading it. You pick up new things each time because the Word of God, it's alive, it's powerful. And as you're reading it, it's reading you. And so depending on where you're at in your life, uh, there's different parts of the truth of God's Word that become more vibrant and more real to you, uh, depending on where you're at and what you need and what the Lord's calling you to do at that point in time. So let's read Daniel chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1, very much like we did last week uh, in chapter 1 of Daniel. We're going to read through this chapter and just kind of hit point by point and, and pick up some very important cues and instructions from the Word of God on what to do when the enemy attacks. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. So here we have in Daniel chapter 6, at this point in time, Daniel is now serving under a new king, and a new kingdom. Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they all are taken in Babylonian captivity around probably, uh, I think it's the first captivity, so that'd be around 589 BC. They're taken into Babylon as captives of the spoils of war when Babylon comes against Israel and the protection of God's no longer around Israel because they have backslidden and they have served other gods and according to God's word and covenant, even after many times sending prophet after prophet to call them to repentance, they eventually just continue in their backslidings and then judgment comes. So Daniel and his three Hebrew buddies, they're in Babylonian captivity under three different kings. Well, in chapter 5, and you'll, you'll actually, um, we, we talked about this in Pride Goes Before Destruction. Uh, I'm kind of getting mixed up on my dates when those replays drop from those live streams we did. But we went through Daniel chapter 5 concerning Belshazzar or Belshazzar. Uh, and at the end of, he, he's the end of the Babylonian captivity. So now we're under the Median Persian kingdom, the Medes and Persians. It was an interesting kingdom. They were a du duality kingdom. Oftentimes there were two thrones, one in Mede, one in Persia. Um, but eventually it would come down to one king. Darius was a Mede, M-E-D-E, -E, a Mede. He was a Mede, and he took the over the Babylonian kingdom from Belshazzar. And so here we are in chapter 6. It's a whole new kingdom. And this king, Darius has decided to put 120 satraps or princes, think of it like a, a rulers, regional rulers, throughout this massive transcontinental uh, kingdom. It's a huge kingdom, the largest in its day at this time. And then he says, I'm going to take three men of high caliber that I trust and set those three as governors over regions. Now, it doesn't say explicitly, but, you know, if you divide 120 by 3, that's 40. So maybe each governor had 40 princes under him, 40 satraps. One of those three governors was a man named Daniel, who we know, 
you know, very well at this point. His name is Daniel. Now notice verse 2, it says, so that the king would not suffer loss. So basically, you know, you've ever been shopping before? None of us in the faithful, we would ever have to be concerned with uh, these uh, folks that work in retail stores because we're not thieves. But it's unfortunate, you know, you go to some retail shops and especially larger department stores, they'll have a guy or a gal with a vest on and it says, Inventory Loss Prevention. Basically, they're walking around to make sure no one's shoplifting. <laughs> well, that's what's taking place here. Darius says, I'm going to set three men over all these princes to make sure that the kingdom doesn't suffer loss, to make sure that the princes are doing what they're supposed to do, that everything's on the up and up, that they're not abusing their power, or you know, when they take up taxes, they're not skimming off the top to make themselves rich and do more than they're supposed to do. So notice verse 3, Daniel 6 verse 3, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors. So out of the three governors, he's the best. And the satraps, all these princes. So there's 100, 120 princes, three governors, that's 123. Daniel is better than all 122 of them. He distinguished himself. Now how did he distinguish himself? The word tells us. Because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Excellent spirit. That literally means an honorable, wise, upright, righteous, just spirit was in him. Obviously, that's the spirit of the Lord. And his heart was turned toward Jehovah, turned toward the Lord. Daniel lived a life in obedience to God. He loved the Lord, and at this point, he's an old man. You know, we, we, if you're reading through the book of Daniel, you think, well, you know, in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I can read through chapters 1 to 6, but you have to keep in mind, and this is something you need to keep in mind anytime you're reading your Bible, what you or I can read in 30 minutes might actually be someone's entire life. You know, you read through one of these minor prophets in about six minutes, like Nahum, it's three chapters. I actually read, you know, I, I'm redeeming the time, as the book of Ephesians tells, tells us to do, to redeem the time. And one of the things I like to do is, I love my paper Bible. If you don't have a paper Bible, you need a paper Bible. Well, what translation should I get, AJ? The one you'll read. <laughs> uh, the one that I use on all my teaching is the New King James Version. And I have people always ask this, you know, I should do a little short video about it, but people always ask what Bible I'm using. It's a Thomas Nelson center column reference Bible, meaning that there's two columns of Scripture with a center column in the middle of references, of cross-references, chain references, and literal translations of specific words. And it's in the New King James Version. And it's wrapped in black goat skin. It was a gift from my father uh, several years back, and I've used the hound out of it, and I love this Bible. But you need a paper Bible. When you're reading a paper Bible, you just, you know, there's no notifications dinging off, and you don't have to plug it in. You, you know, you're not going to get distracted by reading your Bible, and, and then all of a sudden you think about something like, oh, I'm going to post this. Oh, that's a good scripture. I've done this so many times, y'all. Maybe you've done it. I'm reading on my cell phone or my iPad. I'm like, whoa, that scripture is fire, fire, bro. You know, you're reading that scripture like, man, that's good. I'm going to go post that on my social media. And you go to post it. And the next thing you know, you have spent 17 minutes scrolling Instagram. And you stop and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What am I doing? I wasn't even, I just came on here to post a scripture. <laughs> and 17 minutes later, you get back to your Bible reading. That never happens with a paper Bible. Now, with that being said, I was out in my garage. I got a garage gym set up out there. And in between sets, I pulled out my iPad and I opened up my Bible. And I was reading through Nahum <laughs> because the chapters are so short. So keep that in mind. You might be able to read Daniel chapter 6, you know, in 10 minutes. Or we'll study through the whole thing you know, summary-wise, skimming through it, hitting the high points in 30 minutes. You could take hours if you wanted. But even if you took a whole day to study out one chapter, this is a long time. And Daniel has gotten to a point where he's an old man at this point, and he's still faithful to God. That's why he had an excellent spirit. Notice this, verse 3, because an excellent spirit was in him, 
The king thought to setting him over the whole realm. You know, that should encourage you. When you work as unto the Lord, in Colossians chapter 3, I believe it is. Let's read it. Let's hit that. This is an excellent verse for you to keep in your heart and your mind. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily or wholeheartedly, completely, fervently, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now that's important, especially in today's culture. You go to places, that word heartily, I'm looking it up. It means... Let's see. Out of the heart, with full fervency, with fullness of heart, completely, like everything that's in you, you do it. It's not just like a superficial act. It's within you. There's this desire and burning to work and work unto the Lord. And then verse 24 tells us, knowing that you're going to receive your reward from the Lord because actually you're serving Christ. You know, and I was, let me finish this thought. The, the culture we live in, it's like customer service has just went to pot. You know, you go to restaurants, you go to stores, you work with businesses. Not everyone, but it just seems like over the past several years, and this is obviously from all the COVID stuff, when everything got shut down, it's like everybody forgot how to work with people, work for people, to serve people, and, and, and people forgot what it actually felt like to have good customer service. Maybe I'm the only one, and I don't try to be, I'm not hard-nosed or not easy, I'm easy to get along with. I really am. But it feels like no one, generally speaking, no one knows how to act anymore. No one knows how to dress appropriately for the work they do. You know, it's just strange, man. But I'm telling you this, if you'll do everything you do, including your job, you know, maybe you're in high school, you're in college, you're working a part-time job. If you work that part-time job like you own the business, I'm, I guarantee you, you can come find me and slap me if, if this isn't true. <laughs> I'm not going to give you my address, though. You have to do that on your own. You have to find that out on your own. But I guarantee you this. If you'll work your part-time job as if Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, is your boss and he's looking over your shoulder the entire time, which he is, and you honorably do your job and you go above and beyond what you're called to do, and you're not one of these people who say this worthless statement, well, that's not my job. You know, among successful people, they realize, and it was a business article I read a, year, a few years back, but successful people realize, it's an 80-20 rule, that roughly 20% of the work you do doesn't fall under, quote-unquote, your job. Everybody has to do things that isn't, quote-unquote, your job, their job. Because if you wait for someone to come and do that task, just pawning off on someone, you'll never get your job that day done. So sometimes you have to stop and do something that seems menial, less than, or not what you're paid for. But if you just go ahead and knock it out and keep moving forward, I guarantee you the Lord will reward you. And that will come in form of promotion and exaltation. Maybe you end up owning the business that, that's the person that gets promoted. And Daniel had that excellent spirit. He wasn't walking around saying, well, that's not my job. No, he had an excellent spirit. So much so that King Darius said, you know what? I may let Daniel rule this whole kingdom. You know, it's interesting, the parallels of Daniel and Joseph. And I think we may have mentioned this last week in the other wake-up call concerning Daniel. But Daniel and Joseph had a very similar life and, and the way they were both in captivity. They were both slaves, but yet they're slave masters because that's really what it comes down to. This king is his master. He can take his life if he, want, if he wants, but both of their masters exalt them to a high place of prominence all because they lived holy before the Lord and they put God first. It's that Matthew 6.33 principle, but seek ye God and his righteousness well, let, let me. Let, I'm trying to break a habit of just paraphrasing, quote things. If I'm not going to get it word for word, I'd rather just read it. Let me read it. Matthew six thirty three. Matthew six thirty three. You guys, the faithful, probably can already quote it. As I'm turning there, Matthew six thirty three. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, 
and all these things shall be added unto you. In Matthew 6, there in that portion of Matthew 6, the things that are added Jesus is referring to is what you eat, what you wear, where you live, stuff, provision, material need and prosperity and abundance or lack thereof. And Jesus is saying everything you need in this life, you'll get it if you'll simply put God first. Put God and His kingdom and His righteousness first. The kingdom first rule. If you put the kingdom of God first, then everything else will come along with it. And so Daniel's doing that. He had that kingdom first mentality. Daniel chapter 6 verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find a charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against him concerning the law. Oh, excuse me. We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now, th- pause right there for a second. Can that be said of you and me? You know what? The only way we're going to catch AJ and get AJ in trouble is if we come up with something that prevents him from obeying the law of his God. That's what they're saying about Daniel. Basically what they're saying is, let's, let's see if we can get rid of Daniel. Now, here's the problem. They look at Daniel's life. They say, okay, Daniel doesn't do anything wrong. We can't find any dirt on Daniel. And the only way we're going to get rid of Daniel is if we create a law that prevents Daniel from obeying the law of his God. Because we know Daniel, and there's nothing that Daniel will allow to come in between him and serving his God. Let that be said of you and me, the faithful. Let it be said of us, that there is nothing, there's no dirt on these guys. The faithful, you can't find any dirt on them. Nope, you can't find any dirt on the faithful. And the only way we're going to get them, quote unquote, in trouble is if we create a law that stops them from obeying the law of God because they'll break that law in order to obey the law of their God. Well, that's exactly what they do. Verse 6, So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the kingdoms, all the governors of the kingdom, and the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So these guys, they come in and they begin to really lay it on thick to King Darius. They began to flatter Darius and speak flatteries and just build him up to the point of him just thinking, you know what, that sounds pretty great. No one should pray to anyone but me for 30 whole days. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I am a pretty good king, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds really good. You know what, I think we'll go ahead and sign that into law. Beware of flattery. When someone starts to flatter you, you need to have your guard up. Truly. And you know what, if someone's giving you a compliment, that's one thing. But when someone begins to flatter you and just lay it on thick, you need to be beware. You need to have your ears open and your eyes open. Psalms 5 verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Verse 10, pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out of the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. Flattery is just simply lying with some makeup on. You know, it's the old classic uh, saying, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. 
You can dress up a pig, but at the end of the day, he's going to wallow around in mud and mire. He's going to eat slop. Flattery is nothing more than lies, but it looks and sounds real nice. And these guys, they trick Darius into signing this law. And here's the thing. Keep in mind, we talked about Esther uh, several wake-up calls ago. You can scroll back if you missed those. But in the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, they had a law that once the king passes a law, that's it. Nobody gets to change it. It's written, and it will not be changed. It's the same way with Artaxerxes, Ahasuerus, in the day of King Esther, or excuse me, Queen Esther. There's a law that's written and no one can change it. If I go in before the king <clears throat> and he doesn't hold up the scepter, I'll be killed. It's the same, it's the same kingdom there. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Verse 10 of Daniel 6. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as his custom since early days. So Daniel hears about the decree. No one prays to anybody but King Darius for the next 30 days. And if you do, you're going to be thrown in the lion's den. Daniel hears that. Thanks. Hmm. Oh, wow. Looks at his watch. Oh, it's prayer time. And heads back to the house, opens up his window, looks toward Jerusalem, and begins to pray. <laughs> it didn't phase the man. Remember, he's an old man of faith. He's not grown cold as he's aged, like King Solomon did. King Solomon was fervent in faith and serving the Lord when he was young. But as he grew old and gathered up a bunch of ungodly women as wives, he walked away from the Lord. Daniel was faithful to the end of his days. And Daniel, this old man of faith, hears this decree. And what does he do? Oh, it's prayer time. You know, the book of Psalms tells us, as Psalms 55, 17, D D David says, King David writing the psalm says, I will pray to you in the evening, the morning, and noon. That's probably what Dan Daniel was doing. Of course, Psalms was written before Daniel's life, so Daniel knows and studies the book of Psalms as well as the prophets and the law. He knows the scripture. Daniel, in the last part of this book, Daniel begins to petition God and pray and say, Lord, according to the words of the prophet Jeremiah, these 70 years of captivity have come to an end. Israel has been in captivity for 70 years. It's time for us to go back to Israel. It's because Daniel is a student of the word that he takes that word before the Lord and reminds God, not that God forgets, but in petition and prayer, reminds God as God commanded us, bring into remembrance my words, reminds God, look, Lord, this is what you said. You said we're going to be in captivity for 70 years and it's been 70 years. So Daniel was a student of the word. And notice it says, as his custom since early days. Daniel just didn't see the law and said, no one's going to pray to anyone but Darius. Well, forget that. I'm praying today. No. He's always prayed to the Lord three times a day. And when a new law came up that would cause him to break his commitment with God, he had the same heart as the apostles had in the book of Acts, Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Daniel had some holy guts about himself and said, you know what? I've served the Lord all these years and I'm not stopping now. I don't care what the threat is. I'm going to pray to my God. Verse 11, Then these men assembled, found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. He was easy to find. The window was open. They could hear him praying. They knew he would continue to pray, just like he always had. That's the whole point. It wasn't a guessing game. It wasn't, let's make this law and see if Daniel falls for it. It's the moment we make this law, we can immediately go to Daniel's house the same time that he always prays, and we'll find him there praying. Let that be said of you and I, the faithful. Well, we, you know, you can't reach AJ early in the morning. Why not? He's praying. Oh, he is? Yeah, he gets up early every day and pray. You know, when's your prayer time? It should be known. You should schedule your prayer time. 
Well, you might say, well, I pray all through the day. Wonderful. You should. But you should pray. You should have a specific time set apart. Maybe it's your commute to work, 30, 40, 50 minute commute to work. Maybe it's the commute back. Maybe you get up early in the morning like I do because if I don't do it early, it doesn't get done. Maybe you're a night out and you pray before you go to bed. You should have a large chunk of your day set apart. You know, like if you can sit down and binge watch three episodes on Netflix that ends up being 52 minutes, you can pray that amount of time. It just takes some discipline. And you do, and maybe you have to build up to a large amount of time. Maybe you start at 10 minutes a day. But have a time you say, this is when I pray, and it's non-negotiable. We do it with everything else. Why shouldn't our meeting and our appointment with God be the most important appointment we have every day? It is, in fact, the most important one. And Daniel had that appointment, and they knew where they could find him. Verse 12, they went before the king, spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statue which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the dens of lions, den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So here they come to the king. They say, look here, king, didn't you make this law? And the king says, oh, yeah, of course I did. Sure, it's a good law, great law, and it won't change. And then they lower the boom. Well, that Daniel is breaking your law three times a day when he prays. And notice, I didn't, I've didn't. i never noticed this before, but verse 14, it says that King Darius was greatly displeased with himself. Why was Darius displeased with himself? Because he fell for the trap of all these princes and the other two governors. They were all envious, jealous of Daniel. They didn't like Daniel because remember, Darius is thinking about putting Daniel over the entire kingdom. So there's probably two reasons why they're jealous. One, they don't want Daniel ruling over them. They want to be in charge. They're greedy for power. But two, they know that Daniel has an excellent spirit. He's upright. He's honest. And he's not going to let anything take place in Darius's kingdom, because he's a man of honor, that shouldn't take place. Meaning that the other two governors and the 120 princes, satraps, they're going to have to actually walk the line. And they don't want to. And that's the problem. That's why they're trying to literally kill off Daniel. And Darius realizes, I fell for this silly trap. They flattered me into signing a law. They talked me up, buttered me up into signing a law to kill off a man that I greatly cherish, that I really think highly of. Dare we say love. Darius, I mean, in order for Darius... To come to the point in his mind and his heart saying, I want to put Daniel in charge of everything. Literally, I will only be over Daniel in title. I'll be, I'll be the king, but Daniel's going to be the man that runs the whole show. He loved Daniel. He honored Daniel. He respected Daniel. And now, from stupid flattery, he's going to have to kill, he's going to have to subject his number one man to the den of lions. 
Now, Darius has, at least on face value, it seems like faith that Daniel's God will deliver him. He says it. So then they put him in the den of lions, they roll a stone, and they seal it. It makes you think of, King, of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? When they put his body in the tomb and seal it and put out Roman centurions in front of it. It's interesting. Of course, both instances, they come out alive. Jesus, three days later, is resurrected. Daniel, he comes out alive the next day. Oh, spoiler alert. If you haven't read this, Daniel lives. <laughs> Daniel 6, verse 18. Now the king went to his palace, spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought before him, and his sleep went from him. It's kind of like the same time when the sleep left the, the king in the book of Esther, and he begins to read and finds out about Mordecai. It's interesting. Verse 19, Then the king arose very early in the morning, went in haste to the den of lions. So the moment that day's over, he's like, Okay, the law's been fulfilled. Anyone that prays to anyone but me gets thrown in the den of lions. But the law doesn't say he has to stay in there forever. He spent the night. Let's go get him. Verse 20, When he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice, a grieved voice, so not very full of hope. To Daniel, the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, shut the lions' mouths, so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up to the den so that Daniel was taken up of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. You know, it's interesting there. Daniel gives two reasons as to why he was able to spend the night in the den of lions, in the lion's den, and come out living. Two reasons. One, he says, one, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. Two, because I believed in God. Hebrews eleven thirty three. Hebrews 11 is the hall of fame of faith of all these heroes of the Old Testament of faith. Daniel's listed, but not by name. Hebrews, Hebrews eleven thirty three says this, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. It was by faith that those lions had their mouths closed up. Daniel actually believed that God would protect him. And God Almighty sent one of his angels to that den of lions to clamp down and put a muzzle, a spiritual muzzle, on those lions' mouths. Oh, Pastor Lester Summerall, he would say, you know, Daniel just decided to sleep and he laid up against one of them lions and elbowed him in the ribs and said, hey, quit snoring. I'm trying to sleep here and use those lions as pillows. <laughs> now, whether he did or not, I don't know, but it makes for fun imagery. Nonetheless, Daniel's faith in God caused him to live the entire night sleeping. You know, think about it. Darius lost sleep, but Daniel didn't. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe Daniel's prayed the whole night. I don't know. But Daniel's not worried. He's not afraid. He's not shaking and quivering. He's got faith. Now, what happens? The king gave the command. They brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Unfortunately, that's just the, the Mede and Persian law. When they would take out what they would call traitors, and in this sense, Darius saw all these princes who schemed up Daniel's demise as a traitor against the kingdom because Daniel was good for the kingdom. They took out the entire family. That was just a, a cruel law in that day and age. It's not a law of God. In fact, God says the opposite. God says in the book of Ezekiel, I can think off of the top of my mind, but I believe Deuteronomy as well, that sons will not suffer punishment for their father's sins or vice versa. But rather the person that sins is the one that will be judged. 
And so that's interesting to, to make a note of because some people say, look at there, God's so mean. God didn't send these people in the, in the lion's den with their wives and children, the innocent with the, with the guilty. God didn't do that. That's against God's nature. Abraham said it concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, you're not a God that would judge the righteous with the unrighteous. And God says, no, I'm not. And that's the reason Abraham tried to petition, but there was none righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. There wasn't even ten. But God said if there were, he wouldn't punish the entire city for the sake of the ten. Proverbs 11, verse 8, The righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. See, here's the thing. You need to be on the right side of God, and you need to walk clean and pure and holy before the Lord. And you don't need to be out to get anyone, because the righteous the Lord delivers and the trouble that was coming against the righteous, the Lord will put it on the wicked. Proverbs twenty six twenty seven: Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it rolled back on him. That's exactly what happened to these guys. They're cast into the very den of lions that they thought would be Daniel's demise. Let's finish up. Verse 25, Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. That's powerful. Daniel, because of his spirit of excellence, an honorable and upright spirit, because he was faithful, even when the enemy attacked, he stood firm in his faith in God. He didn't waver. He didn't change. God delivered him from the very trouble that he was brought into because of faithfulness, the den of lions, he delivers him from that, and the very thing that was used against him became a weapon against the enemies of Daniel. And Daniel remains through the reign of Darius into the next king, King Cyrus, that follows King Darius. And he prospers in all that he does. Let me tell you something. Faithfulness always pays off. Faithfulness always pays off. Even though it may bring attack and persecution, God will deliver you. God will be your defense, and God will prosper you if you'll simply remain faithful. Hey, I'm so thankful that you joined me today for this wake-up call. I pray it encourage you, and I pray, and I know this, you and I, let us have a spirit of excellence. Let us honor God in all things. Let us always put the Lord first, regardless of what the enemy may do, because we know our God will deliver us. He will be our strong tower. He is our defense. He, de he fights for us because we are the faithful. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.